Today we're going to be looking at another one of Kurtz Gazat's videos. Specifically this one right here that says move here to survive a nuclear war. Looks like it's pointing at Argentina, though the map's kind of small. Not sure why. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Check this out. Nuclear war would forever split human history into anything that happened before and the post-war apocalypse. In the worst case, mass A bunch of small bombs creating one explosion. Interesting. ...consume everything within tens of thousands of square kilometers, killing hundreds of millions within hours. But the worst part comes after that. Nuclear war could trigger a nuclear winter that might kill billions maybe even completely collapsing our civilization. So nuclear winter, basically the concept that widespread fires from a large scale nuclear exchange could release enough smoke into the atmosphere to block sunlight, causing a global cooling effect and potentially catastrophic consequences for global climate. I think I'll wait for them to say a bit more about it, but some of those models may have been exaggerated. How does it work? And what would it look like? Fire causes winter. When Song a nuclear weapon and fire. is detonated, a bubble of gas hotter than the sun is forced into existence so hot that everything within kilometers immediately begins to burn. The terror bubble expands rapidly, filling terror the sky bubble. over its target, creating a devastating shockwave that causes most of the immediate destruction. Basically, props to them getting right for the shockwave causing most of the immediate destruction, not the radiation. That's a common misconception out there that the radiation is the worst part. Break a lot of stuff and set it on fire. And in the worst case, this turns into a firestorm that consumes everything and everyone on the ground. Right after the explosion, a gigantic mushroom cloud is over the destruction like a demon throning over its perverse work. But in the following hours... What? Yeah, their, uh, their dialogue in Kurtzgazat's certainly gotten a little bit more poetic. I've noticed this in some of their recent videos, okay? Uh, it's, it's just buoyancy, guys. That's how mushroom clouds work. Not, not a nuclear Hulk demon or anything like that. <laughs> a far more deadly cloud forms. The fire burning cities, forests, or fields heats up so much air that it creates its own microclimate and wind system. Hot air and hot smoke rise, pulling in fresh air from the surroundings and fresh oxygen, stoking the flames even more. This creates an updraft and forms a colossal pyrocumulonimbus cloud that carries the soot and aerosols from the flames high into the stratosphere. It's kind of like a volcanic eruption, albeit on a much smaller scale. Under normal conditions, the soot rising from a big fire is quickly washed out by rain. But a pyrocumulonimbus cloud can reach altitudes well above the height where rain clouds form. Once above the tropopause, there's simply no weather to remove soot from the atmosphere, so it can stay aloft for years. If this happens to a single city, it's a tragedy, but a fairly local one. But in a full-scale nuclear war, warring nations following the cold logic of mutually assured destruction could use hundreds or even thousands of nuclear weapons all at once, creating hundreds of firestorms, sending up to 150 million tons of soot a cube the size of a skyscraper directly into the stratosphere. This animation kind of reminds me of the scene at the end of, I think, Terminator 3 with all the cities being right next to each other. I get what they're doing. They're trying to just show the scale and show multiple cities in one screen. It's pretty cool. In the next few days and weeks, the soot begins to blanket the Earth at high altitudes, absorbing light high above the ground and preventing sunlight from reaching the surface. All right, now I think I realize why they're going for Argentina or at least somewhere in the southern atmosphere because a lot of the targets happen to be in the uh, northern hemisphere. This is not like science fiction where the sky turns dark and the sun disappears. Winter is what happens when just a little less sunlight hits the ground and now suddenly a lot less sunlight gets through. Oh, interesting. I just got the obvious joke. If it's nuclear winter in the northern hemisphere, it must be nuclear summer down in the southern hemisphere, which is why they're saying, gonna say you should go there. All right, that's clever. Took me a couple of minutes to get the, their thumbnail, but I think I got it now. Yesterday, the world was normal. Today, nuclear winter begins. 
Winter causes hunger. Winter is coming. How bad nuclear winter would be is still an active area of research. It all hinges on one thing. How much stuff will burn really hot? How many firestorms will be caused by the heat of the explosions? This depends on many factors, from the materials a city is made of to the time of the year, if a forest is nearby, and so on. And that's really it. It depends on what the targets are, how many targets were hit, how big the nuclear exchange was. It could even depend a little bit on the weather, though probably not that much if we're talking full scale, based on how much smoke is released. It's possible for them to be overly conservative, and one assumption is the, with the mushroom cloud actually making it to the stratosphere and staying it up there for years. That one, a lot of nuclear weapons just aren't that powerful. Weapons like the Sarbama and the Castle Bravo device of 50 and 15 megatons, these multi-megaton devices, that will get you there. But a bunch of smaller, lower, lower yield devices on the order of a few hundred kilotons, which are significantly more common. In fact, only one SAR bomb was ever built, and it was used mainly as an impractical propaganda-type weapon. So you're not going to have that upper stratosphere concentration without more of the higher-yield nukes. And on the note of the soot hanging up there, it's not lighter than air. Some of it's going to fall back to Earth. A lot of the, he the heavy stuff is, the heavy stuff that would have a worse effect in terms of blocking out the sun. So just keep in mind, we're working with some assumptions. Sure. Here's the good but news. This might be the worst case scenario. Nuclear winter is not permanent, and definitely no new ice age. The effects on the climate only last as long as the soot remains in the atmosphere, which is at most a decade or so until it clears out and temperatures normalize. And a lot of it could drop within the order of days to weeks. <laughs> kind of depends what it is. And... Also, these are cities being destroyed. It's possible for some of the soot just to get caught up in the ruins of the city to the point where it wouldn't even rise up into the atmosphere towards the outer edges of the explosion. The bad news is that this causes almost immediate climate change within a few weeks. Yeah. It disrupts our climate system faster than any living being can adapt to. In this new climate, our seasons are suddenly all wrong. Winters are much longer, summers shorter and colder, or gone altogether. This also so basically the exact opposite of the way things are where I live in Texas, where there are three seasons, hot, wretched hot, and February. Means less evaporation over the oceans, which means less rain and maybe large-scale droughts. This is bad because our food eats the sun. Without good summers and enough rain, growing seasons shrink or even collapse. I mean, I can understand the reason for this overestimate of nuclear war, because a full-scale nuclear war is horrific. Wouldn't wipe out all of humanity, but we do not want to stress test this. And I can understand being overly conservative using with assumptions that you're using the multi-megaton weapons and a lot of the soot just happens to hang up into the atmosphere for years and years. Things can be exaggerated, but maybe in a good way. Kind of reminds me of some calculations that uh, nuclear engineers make for safety in power plants, because there are emergency safety systems, backup systems, backups for the backup systems, contingency systems for said backup systems, and then when all else fails, remote backup systems that could be driven or flown in in the event that the region around the entire site is destroyed. After Fukushima is when those contingency plans were put in place. On the other hand, exaggerating the effects of something could point to the exaggerated fear of nuclear in general. Again, I'm pro peaceful use of nuclear power not nuclear weapon. Majority of humanity lives in an area called the mid-latitude, a strip of land that has the ideal temperature for our species. Not just because it's not too hot or cold, it's also where the plants we eat grow yeah, best. The, the vast majority of the food we eat stems from a few highly efficient crops that are mostly produced in a few very agriculturally productive regions like the US Great Plains or Ukraine. From these bread and rice baskets of the world, they get traded and shipped around the world. Oh, now global shipping, international trade, that will be, that will, let's just say that will have to be completely reshaped after a nuclear war, because this whole scenario. 
In the worst case of a full-scale nuclear war, the temperatures in the mid-latitudes will probably stay below freezing for several years. Nothing at all can grow under these conditions, and the world's baskets would suddenly turn empty. If food production crashes, the world's food producers would very likely ramp up Danny prices or even stop selling food to other countries, if they're still able to farm their fields at all. It's easy to calculate how many people can be alive on Earth. You take all the calories we can produce and divide them by what the average person needs to survive. Interesting, simplistic idea, but you're limiting by things like the proved reserve fallacy, kind of like with peak oil, how we're always 20 years away from peak oil. On that note, I think when we hit global peak oil might be the same time we have sustainable nuclear fusion and power plants, because those are both 20 years away. If you have more people than calories, then within a few weeks, you don't anymore. Humanity has only a few weeks supply of crops and food, not enough to survive this drastic drop in production. But the climate is not the only issue. Modern industrialized agriculture is a complex affair that relies on functioning supply chains yeah. to provide unthinkable amounts of industrially produced fertilizer and chemicals to kill weeds and vermin. Yeah, supply chains, well, mainly just because they're so sensitive, they would be severely disrupted by nuclear war. I mean, we saw how badly they got disrupted with COVID, and COVID's nothing compared to this. Massive numbers of specialized modern machinery is plowing, sowing, harvesting, and distributing. After a nuclear war, especially if the countries that produce the food were part of the yep. nuclear exchange, there may simply be no more fuel for... And here they're just using food as an example. Food, energy, shelter, basic commodity supplies such as wood, steel, bricks, things to make structures out of. It's going to hurt everything, big time. Also, medical care. So yeah, I, I see what they're getting at here. Or machine parts, because there are no more oil refineries, ports, and other essential infrastructure left, damaging global food production even more. Okay, so now that we've set the stage, let's look at what science says about the actual casual. wars that could happen. Actual nuclear war. Today, there are two main conflicts that science think about when making calculations of nuclear winter, a nuclear war between India and Pakistan, and one between the US and Russia. The most likely smallish nuclear exchange would be fought today. Interesting. I'm not a geopolitical expert, but interesting that those are the most likely ones. ...between India and Pakistan, with relatively low-yield weapons. Even in a pretty mild nuclear war like this, the immediate explosions would kill around 27 million people, which is horrible enough. Yeah. In just a few hours, more people would die than in all of World War I. The ensuing the fires World War II, would not cause a nuclear winter, but a mild nuclear autumn. But even this would... Nuclear autumn, really? Never heard that one. ...disrupt the climate and thereby global agriculture. Enough to starve up to 250 million people worldwide. I might need to look at some of their sources that they used on that one, but I'm assuming they're using worst case scenario numbers because trying to estimate that is very difficult because it's a secondary effect. Unfortunately, India and Pakistan are in an arms race and have been increasing the number and power of warheads in their arsenal. The next stage of escalation would be war with hundreds of nuclear weapons, the bombs and fires destroying major population centers and killing over 100 million people. A war on this scale wow. would cause a nuclear winter that would damage global agriculture enough to cut the available calories for humanity in half. The number of people that starve to death would be as high as 2 billion. Available calories, that's an interesting way of putting it. I wonder if they're, if they're counting both strategic reserves and potential crops they can grow all at once. Because I know previously they just mentioned about what, they, what can be grown, but yeah, that's, uh, that's tricky. One in four humans alive today. The worst case scenario is a full-scale global war between NATO nations and Russia, or China, which also continues to build its nuclear arsenal. In a war between a former... Interesting picking China as a different thing, which was different than, say, the Cold War between NATO and the Soviets. ...and current superpower, thousands of nuclear weapons could be detonated. In a scenario with around 4,400 nuclear weapons, 360 million people would perish right away. We have no other event to even compare the death and destruction to. It's like humanity dropping an asteroid on itself. The nuclear winter that follows such an apocalyptic war would tank human calorie production by as much as 
Not only would almost all of our agriculture take an immediate and deadly hit, the climate would take at least a decade to recover. Because a war like this would specifically hit the world regions that produce most of the food for humanity, recovery will be much, much harder than with other conflicts. Within t It's interesting, I think, I think Kurtzgesatz probably d using the middle of the road approach, because I've heard the, the earlier report from back in the 80s was even worse than this, if you can believe it, just straight up humanity wiping itself out. Whereas this is super horrific, but not like not making the world uninhabitable for millennia, just for, for decades, which I know if this is the first time you've watched anything like this, this still sounds pretty bad, but it's like, hey, it's a, I guess it's a bit of an improvement from something I read a, a long time ago. <laughs> But they're going for a middle-of-the-road approach. Doesn't necessarily mean it's accurate. I know there's the golden mean fallacy there. Is the global death toll from starvation could rise to about 5 billion. In mid-latitude countries like Russia, China, Canada, the US, and much of Europe, only a few percent of the population might survive. Humanity will never be the same again. While nowhere is truly take safe, a while. some nations in the Southern Hemisphere may fare well enough to endure while the rest of the world collapses. All the nuclear weapon states are in the Northern Hemisphere, so a few countries like Australia, New Zealand and Argentina may be able to endure for a bunch of different reasons. Their nuclear winter would be milder, they have a Waiting lot of livestock it. that would not be as affected as crops, so they would probably stop exporting food and focus on keeping their own people alive. I think they aren't in I seriously thought they were going to say if it's nuclear winter in the Northern Hemisphere, then it would be nuclear summer in the Southern Hemisphere. But that might be a bit of a mood whiplash, given the seriousness of this subject. For their food by other starving nations. It's safe to say that the world would become extremely unpleasant for a long time, and it's impossible to know how many people would have died when the nuclear winter ends. That's just it, and there's so many again margins of error just like what what i mentioned earlier about the weapons and how much would stay in the upper atmosphere but the supply chain disruption is pretty much guaranteed though the question is just how long because again we lived through that with coven in the worst case human civilization could collapse and the survivors would be thrown back thousands of years slowly trying to recover a world full of scars and graves eventually I mean, if that many people really is wiped out, then it would take, there's a lot of lost knowledge with a lot of people in very specialized fields that probably wouldn't make it, or if they did, they wouldn't have the support systems they need to effectively do anything. And yes, that would include nuclear engineers like me, because I'm dependent on so many other industries to do the very specialized thing. You need heavy industry for nuclear power plants. When they've rebuilt civilization, would they ever build nuclear weapons again? Probably, because if we're talking thousands of years, their descendants might just remember it as some sort of epic battle between gods or something, and by the time they figure out what nuclear weapons are again, if it really sets people back that far. But I don't know. It might not. Again, we're talking hypothetical worst-case scenarios of a worst-case scenario, so quite a bit of extrapolation going on there. But yeah, as far as Kurtzgesatz's video, I think they're less alarmist than a lot of things I've read on Nuclear Winter, but I think they're still overrating it with some of the assumptions they make they made earlier that I already talked about. Overrating something that's horrible isn't bad. It's a key principle behind how robust safety systems are designed, but it could also lead to a bit of an overly alarmist nature provoking fear, kind of like in the case of global climate change, but that's a topic for another video. What do you think? Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.